Hey, good afternoon, guys. Welcome to another uh, Project Limited webinar. We'll be starting here in a couple of minutes. Uh, just give a couple more people uh, a minute or two to uh, get settled in. I see a couple of people are, uh, hey, uh, Pablo from Toronto. And if you guys want, in the meantime, uh, we do have a couple of handouts. So if you guys wanted to uh, go next to the chat window, there are a few uh, different handouts there you can go ahead and download uh, while we wait. I think most of you guys are answering some of the poll questions as well. So if you don't mind uh, giving your input there. And we will be starting here very shortly. All right, well, I guess we will jump into it. Um, so good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Digital Transition Project Webinar Webinar Series, the workflow of food photography. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join us today. My name is Jeff Lynn, and I'm the Northeast Rep for DT. Some of you may be familiar with me from handling your capture one licenses and phase one systems. I'm uh, currently in Brooklyn, New York, and so there may be some fire trucks or ambulances in the background, so uh, don't be alarmed if you hear any sirens. Uh, I'd like to share some more information about DT for those of you that aren't familiar with us. We have uh, four different divisions, commercial, culture heritage, pixel acuity, and scientific. I work with uh, commercial photographers, and our culture heritage division works with museums, universities, and libraries by providing turnkey solutions with advanced reprographic copy stance. Pixel acuity is our service bureau division, and DT Scientific provides industrial solutions. We're primarily known as a phase one dealer, but we're also dealers for Profoto, Bond Color, Cambo, Arca Swiss, and Asa Monitors. We have two offices uh, located in New York and LA, and we have over 20 employees across the US. Here are a few links if you're interested in learning more about the products and services that we specialize in. We offer the latest equipment, but we also have some entry level systems on our outlet website. Uh, we also have remote demo capabilities, and we can arrange for a rental of the equipment and apply the cost towards purchase. And as I mentioned before, uh, my name is Jeff Lynn, and I'm on the commercial sales division. Uh, my colleagues Arnab Chatterjee and Kate Stone are also here with us today, and we'll be in the chat window if you have any questions during the presentation. I'd like to now introduce Andrew Burkle, who has consistently and exclusively been a staple on food photography sets for over a decade. He discovered his love for food photography while working in Chicago as a photo assistant and digital tech, and has since brought his ingredient-focused and color-rich style to many clients along the way. He strives to provide a unique approach and a collaborative mindset to every project, not to mention providing a healthy mix of curiosity, hard work, humor, and hunger to every shoot. Now co-owner and lead photographer at Berkel Hagen Studio in Cleveland, Ohio, he and his team work with food clients from across the country out of the 6,000 square foot studio, complete with a custom commercial kitchen that is a food stylist paradise. For Andrew, food is not only a passion, it's a lifestyle. Thank you, Jeff. Um... Hi everyone from tuning in from all over the world. Um, so this is Burke Lagan Photography. We're here right now and I'll, I'll kind of go through our team right now. I'm Andrew. Um, Claire is behind me over here. So Claire's going up. She's our food stylist. Today we're going to do a demo um, of a sandwich that we shot uh, just a little bit ago, but we'll run through how we did it. Um, over here we have Anna as our studio assistant, and then Josiah is our second photographer. He's gonna be helping us out today too. Um, so quickly explaining the goals of our studio. Um, we are exclusively a food photography studio, and we work with uh, a wide range of clients, mostly commercial food, um, and it's very detail oriented. Um, you know, a lot of clients really want the 
little fine details and that's what we can provide. Um, we shoot primarily um, about 99% out of studio um, in this space we're in right now. And it helps us control variables. Um, so normally we will book in a prep day for every shoot we have, no matter how big or how small, just so we can get everything um, built and tested and lit and have stand-ins in just so when we start shooting and a uh, client throws us a curveball or anything like that, we can adjust and we can uh, work the problem very quickly. Um, so that being said, the studio was built out exclusively for food photography. And um, I don't know if I mentioned we're in Cleveland, Ohio, and there's a lot of old warehouses in Cleveland. So that's a 6,000 square feet. And I'll take you guys on a quick tour of it. Um, so follow me. So here's our set that we um, have our sandwich set up today. So you can see we have our face camera set up. Um, we have our sandwich on set. And over here we have our iPad for our food stylist to look at. So when she's styling, she can see directly what's happening live. Um, she can control the camera and take pictures as needed. And that's really a, a great tool for us. So everything here we set up yesterday, just like we do for a normal prep day. Hey, uh, Andrew. Yes. Um, so your video seems to be frozen. Uh, did you disconnect from like a, a charger or something or a dock? I did, but okay. I did that earlier too. Yeah. Um, can you try refreshing your page and then restarting the tour? I'll let you know if we can see your, your video when you rejoin. All right, folks, thanks for dealing with us uh, or dealing with these technical difficulties. Hey, oh, yeah, there you go. Know. All right, we've got a Wi-Fi issue. OK, so All right. go right what ahead. What we're doing now is I'll just take you on a video tour. So again, this is our set right here. So we have our face camera set up. Uh, we have our sandwich, our hero sandwich on set already. Um, you can see over here we have our iPad set up for uh, the food stylist to kind of take a look at what she's doing on set and making sure all the details are looking good. Uh, we built out this set yesterday just so we could simulate what a prep day is for us usually. So um, on set here we have about seven lights and this little tiny sandwich. Um, so that was all fine-tuned earlier today. Um, and normally that's a prep day for us. You know, we just make sure that everything's looking great and when the client's in and the product's on, that way we can just deal with uh, food styling and lighting and tweak it and go. Um, if you want to follow me, I'll show you the rest of the studio. Well, you can climb area, so breakfast, lunch area for them to grab, breakfast, lunch, whatever they need. Um, kitchen is right over here. It's set up for two food stylists and two assistants so that we can run two uh, sets at once, two photographers. So um, everything's mirrored in here. So we have uh, four ranges and cooktops and dishwashers and sinks. Everything's mirrored and doubled. So there's plenty of room in this studio to ha handle big productions. Um, you know, sometimes we'll have five sets going at once with two photographers and a lot's going on at once. So we need the space. So follow me. So it looks pretty empty right now, but normally this whole thing is filled up with production uh, and extra sets and lights. So you can see behind me, we have surfaces for shooting on. We can pick all that out. Um, that's a shooting cart back there. That's an extra one. We have two extra ones that are put away in the closet right now, but little stations around the studio where we can hardwire in and make sure that we can build sets around that. So follow me, I'll show you the prop room. So this is big for us because we don't have a rental house in Cleveland. So everything has to be on hand. So either we have a budget for our clients and we buy things that we need for certain shoots, or we have everything here in our prop room and we can pick from it and kind of pull out potential props for clients to approve day of or in pre-pro meetings uh, before the shoot or production starts. So it's, let's say it's about a 900 square foot room just how you can pan this way a little bit. It keeps going a little bit that way. And we'll come around this way so you can see. 
everything in the property you can access from either side, plates, glasses, uh, all the, uh, the little uh, drawers behind me have flatware in them. So we can really kind of build a, a cool set that's unique for every client. Um, call me this one. So we have our printer for proofs for clients. Um, this room back here is our retouching room. No one is in today, but we have our we have our entrance way here, and then back over this way we have our client conference room for them to take calls for, and kind of they can close the doors on either side and have some privacy. Then we have our lounge areas. Um, for clients and the lunch table back over here where um, as of three months ago we'd all sit and we could cram 12 people at that table but now it holds more about four on a given day so okay we'll come back to set and we will go over uh, the workflow of what we did today Okay. Okay. So I had mentioned uh, earlier um, about stand-ins and working from the iPad and really kind of dialing everything else in uh, the day before or early uh, on the day of the sh actual shoot. So this is our final sandwich that we shot that you can see right now in the capture program. Um, everything was styled and lit and everything this morning and then around noon we actually took the final capture. Um, so yesterday we we sized into a roll of gaff tape and that just gave us like a general idea of what the set was going to be and then our food stylist Claire put together a um, stand-in sandwich that I lit. So basically this kind of gives us the idea of color and uh, size and everything like that. We can talk to art directors about height and cropping and everything with a stand-in. It's basically like the equivalent if you're shooting a on-figure model would be someone that's a similar height, um, complexion, uh, things like that, that help you really light and get this kind of dialed in. Um, I showed you on set we had the iPad set up for uh, in Capture One and that's down here in Capture Pilot. Um, we utilize that um, even if we have four sets. We have four iPads and everything set up so, you know, the food stylists can really see what they're doing instead of having to turn around, squint at the screen. Um, it's a really helpful tool. And they can control the camera. And, you know, if they make one move, they don't have to shout for the photographer and uh, have them come over and take a picture for them. Um, so basically... Before all this is done, right, we have the standing in. Uh, we make sure that we have our ChronoSync, which is a backup software set up to, um, so this time we just have the rugged set up to our capture program. Now that, you run it and basically just as you're going, it will back up directly in the background of your production. Um, normally we have two of these windows up and one goes to uh, a rugged and the other one goes to another drive and that's just for raw files. Um, how we handle it here is at the end of the day, we um, have all files in four locations at the end of the day. Um, and that's you know just personal preference, but I'm, I'm kind of a crazy person on backing up the work. Um, you know, a lot of those drives are just, just in case things happen, but if we also have to switch shooting stations, we can just grab a, a drive and change it up and we can kind of work on, on the fly. Um, now, all this setup and uh, preparedness for the shoot, I'll explain to you why we have to do that. So I'm going to bring up Photoshop here. I have some examples of previous uh, jobs. So everything we shoot is very macro and very detail-oriented. Um, and 
you know, clients really expect everything to be perfect looking to the ice, the condensation, to the limes, everything. Um, so we really have to be prepared up front. So when we get into this, that we can just run through the day. Now, if we're working with a client that wants eight shots in a day, you break that down throughout the day, you have about 45 minutes per shot. And it doesn't sound like, a, it sounds like a lot of time, but it's really not when you start food styling and picking things apart with uh, an art director. So one of the things I wanted to discuss today was the um, focus stacking feature of the phase cameras. Um, for us and shooting macro and with clients that don't know whether they want to have a horizontal layout or a vertical layout or anything like that, or if down the road, say their format changes, um, they might need to kind of move things around in the frame after it's shot. Um, so instead of coming back to us and having to book another shoot, which, you know, ideally that would be great, but in real world budgets are what they are. So we try to give our clients uh, the most flexibility possible with the images we capture. So focus stacking with macros is huge because with a macro lens, even at a high aperture like an F16 or something, you might get um, only about an inch of coverage, depending on how close you are, right? So if it's F16, maybe you only get this front bottle in focus, right? So we run a focus stacking uh, feature, which I will go through once we go back and demo this. But basically, it's the camera automates different focus levels throughout an image. And it might take about 30 images captured to get from this front ledge all the way behind all these things in the frame here. Now, what that does is, you know, we can focus on one thing at a time. So we can style this out, shoot it as a full focus, take that out, shoot this as a full focus, and I'll show you what that does. So, so that gives us the ability to kind of turn off these layers when we send it to the final client and say they wanted these limes maybe further over here, right? So they can do that. Now, we go through that and we can turn off any and all of these layers and turn them, that's a different uh, blurred level for the background back there. Mojito glass can go off. So basically now this gives the client an opportunity to um, really go in there and if, if they wanted to make a square crop and they have to move you know the margarita bottle around or something like that everything is in full focus pack sharp and they don't have to worry about weird things if if they pull an item forward or backward that one thing's in focus and the other one's not in focus um so that's one example so this one was one we did for burger king for the whopper um same kind of deal with this um this one's the working file, so there's a lot of different things going on here. But you can take the sandwich away, you can take the drink away, uh, move them around as need be. Um, this one, obviously this was a very strange crop. Um, and we spent all day making the background, preparing each one of these for Hero. And believe it or not, three pasta dishes like this took the entire day to complete. And so these are all on their own layer also. So again, that gives the client the opportunity to go in, select a layer, and let's say they want to scoot this out a little bit, and then recrop. They can do that. Um, we always work with Overlays on just to make sure we're fitting into the correct crop of the clients. Um, so that leads us to what we shot today. Today um, we shot a veggie sandwich and this is the full focus version of this sandwich. Now it doesn't really look like it's full focus, but I just did through the sandwich from about the beginning of the sandwich all the way through the parchment in the back. Um, zoom in, you can tell there's not a whole lot of focus drop off 
throughout the sandwich. Tack sharp all the way through. So I go into capture one. And again, we already shot this sandwich, but I'm just going to go through the, the actions of how we did this. So basically, each one of these is just slightly at a different focus. So that's the back focus moving forward. Barely tell it's moving. So the camera automates that. And that's part of the face, the face uh, feature that we love the most. Um, when you output it, they go into their own folders and we'll go through that when we do the demonstration. Um, we have that set up as an automation through the uh, process recipes. So again, for that one sandwich, we took 24 images. Okay, so I'm gonna select those. I'm gonna bring open a program called Helicon Focus, which we use very often uh, for basically every job we do. So take those images and you drop them in here. And it loads it in. And you can tell from how we shot this at F8, up front, it's only focused on the very front items of the sandwich. But all these different files are slowly moving backward in the focus. So you hit render. And you can see the program slowly building out the sandwich uh, as a full focus file. And Believe it or not, this takes a little bit of time, but in the past, you'd have to do this manually in Photoshop and strip away each section that was in focus as a layer and mask it. And that was not a whole lot of fun for anybody. Um, so this really automates things very quickly and we can show clients basically right after capture what the uh, final shot's gonna look like and explain how they have are going to have uh, latitude on the post end to kind of manipulate their images so however they see fit. I'm just gonna let this wrap up. So you can slow, see it slowly building forward on each capture that's set up that's slightly different in a, at a different focal length. Okay, so you can see on your left, this is the shallow depth of field image of just one shot. This one over here is now a focus stacked image that is tack sharp from front to back. And I can show you zooming in. Sorry about that. So basically this file is saved out here. So this, as you can tell, pack sharp, front to back. Everything's looking good. So how do we do that in camera? Um, I'm gonna stop my screen share real quick. And come back to you. Okay. You hold that? So the face camera actually has a really great built-in feature to it that we utilize again, basically for every shoot. So it's built into the camera here um, on top and you set your back focus and where you want it to go to and then your front focus and where you want it to stop. You go to autofocus and I already have it pre-programmed and then you just hit this back, back button. Oh, you know what? We're not tethered, that's why. <laughs> okay. Let me... 
screen share with you again. Can you tether up? And from uh, Rebecca, and she wanted to know um, why do you use method B as opposed as opposed to method C, and what are your settings? So um, our settings in Silicon are method B and Actually, this is, we're using a laptop we don't normally use. We normally have this at is it eight and four, right, guys? Normally at eight and four down here. Um, basically, we came to those conclusions on method B and eight and four just because of trial and error. We've, we ran a bunch of different tests. Um, you know, it depends on how low your aperture is and how many captures you actually are shooting with. Um, you get a weird halo effect around it sometimes, and I can even zoom into this capture file. And you can, I haven't cleaned this one up all the way yet. You can tell here, and I don't know from the uh, cast or not, if you can see that there's a little bit of a halo effect. So a lot of times you can just clean that up with a, cl a clone stamp tool, and it's not a big deal. Um, you know, the amount of time it saves you to automate it and cleaning that up with a heel, uh, heel brush tool is, is pretty easy. So we just kind of came up with those method B and numbers right there just from running a bunch of different tests and seeing what worked and what didn't. Um, yeah, so that's that. So um, so I showed you on camera like how we set that full focus. And then I can't show you at the same time, but you'll see, you wanna hit the, okay. So the camera is now running a full focus. So you see these images coming in slowly. And again, this sandwich has been on set for a little bit, so it looks maybe not as good as it once did. So this focus stack is automated for 24 images. And we've set the back focus back at the back of the parchment and the front focus up here in the front. And the really great thing about working with the phase one for the focus stacking is that um, the movements are the same each and every time. So if you have, like we're on a camera stand here, if you have to run a bunch of different things, if I have to remove this sandwich and shoot the board or the parchment empty or the glass, every single capture is gonna be 24 images and nothing's gonna move. And it's, it's really easy in Photoshop then to build out one of those files that I showed you earlier. Because um, nothing moves and all the captures are exactly the same. Um, We've worked with Nikons in the past, and you can do it with that, but you have to do the, the uh, focuses manually. And it looks like we have a, uh, we had some misfires in that full focus, but we'll, we'll be working on our earlier one that we did earlier today. Um, so we've worked with Nikons in the past, and the Nikons are great, um, but the only thing about that is you have to do it manually each time. And that means that you just have to move that focus point a millimeter at a time each and every time. And, you know, sometimes you might end up with 24 captures for a full focus, and sometimes you might end up with 28, sometimes you might end up with 22. Um, you you kind of get good at doing it manually as you go, but the hard part is when you take that manual focus stack and you stack it and you bring it into post, when you're doing these, there's something called focus breathing and the uh, the focus mechanism and what aperture you're at will fluctuate a little bit. So if you have more captures, um, you might not have as, uh, as much focus breathing as a, another thing. So when you go to line these up in layers and you're just dragging them over, you might have to resize them a little bit in, in Photoshop um, each time when you're doing it with manual. Um, with the automated system in the phase, you bring them over and they land exactly in the same spot that they would um, in just a single capture, for instance. So, um, and also the uh, the handouts that I uploaded to the platform, um, they explain how we do all that too. So a big thing that works for us is when we're in the program, say we already did a full focus, right? And 
we are, see where that's our stand in. Okay, so, so this is our hero sandwich that we want to save out. Um, but we know that we have to move on and shoot another part of this exact shot. Maybe the food style has just changed um, something. We'll shoot it without sauce first in case it doesn't fall apart. Uh, we, we don't have a whole lot of time because all this lettuce is going to wilt. So I can't pause and work on workflow and output while we need to be shooting. So, but we also need to show the client a final image at the same time. So we've automated hotkeys in Capture One. And so if you see on screen here, there's a little icon in the thumbnails right here. And that is a sequence ID. So that denotes that there is a focus stack for that given shot. Um, you'll notice if I scroll back up, it looks like they're all focus stacks. Okay. So if it wasn't focus stack, it would not have that little, little icon right there. So right there, I know that that is my focus stack. So then we've made it so you could do command S and it just selects that focus stack. All right, so that's 24 images right there that we have selected. So again, with I think everything past capture one 11 in the edit area, there's an edit keyboard shortcuts and you go into select and then I believe it is select by same and then sequence ID. So see, we have it as command S. So basically every single time you run a full focus, I don't have to go in and check my numbers and see which one was the starting point, what was the ending point. Because when you're shooting everything that's on a tripod and it hasn't moved, everything looks the same in these uh, thumbnails. So that's a really quick way that we've gotten to kind of speed up our workflow a little bit. The other thing we did was that in our output, we made a custom uh, process recipe for full focuses. So what that does for us is basically we save out uncompressed TIFFs. Um, oh, that's another thing too. So Helicon Focus, if you ever try to save out as a PSD, it will not work. You either have to do um, a TIFF or a JPEG in Helicon. So it has to be TIFF. So full focus, and this we have two recipes selected or uh, made. One is selected, and one is just respect crop. So we have bleed room around this in case, let's say, we were working with a client and they wanted to do a more um, horizontal. They wanted some type over here or something like that. So we always shoot with a crop on to give a little bleed room for the client. So we have respect crop uh, highlighted. So all the uh, basic information is the same. It's right here in file. Um, subfolder, and this is where it's, it actually saves us. When I found this out, I was actually at a, uh, the phase one certification. Uh, I was at Digital Transitions, and I learned that there, and this saved us so much time in the studio when we're doing jobs. So basically, it selects your sequence type and then automatically puts it in its own full focus folder. So that looks like in Finder, this. So we output something and right away there's a, there's a folder that says focus stacking. And then each folder automatically, 24 images in each folder. So every time I output a whole sequence, so I'm gonna do my command S 24 images, I would output that, and I'll do that right now just to show you guys. So command D is our process shortcut. So then this is a new one. So this just made itself in here, and you can see the files coming in. And I'm on a laptop, so it's a little slower than normal. But um, that's another thing, joy with shooting with the face cameras, uh, and you're doing focus stacking, you have a cropped image that is 150 megabytes per file. Um, you know, some of these images that I showed you earlier in Photoshop, I use this brand equity one as a jumping off point. Um, 
we have this broken down as the glass was a full focus, the napkin was a full focus, the cutting board was a full focus, this was a full focus. This So this whole image, basically, we probably took maybe 20 full focus stacks. And at 30 frames per full focus stack, you know, adds up to be hundreds and hundreds of images. And you need to keep a good workflow and track of that on the, on the fly. So uh, automating all these processes really saves us a lot of time. Um, and it makes us work really efficient, especially when you have eight shots in a day and each shot has multiple fo full focus stacks. Or let's say you're, which we did today, You're shooting this. Uh, yeah, go ahead. There's a question. Uh, do you have a temporary focus stack with JPEGs to do a quick preview sometimes? Uh, we do not, but normally um, we're, shoot, we're shooting to Mac Pros usually. And this, I'm on a, a laptop for this webinar, so it's a little bit slower. Normally, for something like this, it could fly through it in just maybe about five seconds or so. Um, so I save that out, and then we can show clients. Um, I do, I also do a lot of live retouching on set. So if let's say we were doing this sandwich and a lot of times we'll shoot through it before we put sauce on, in, on, uh, the final hero, just because, um, sometimes you put sauce on it and it just kills the entire hero. Um, so that's kind of like a safety net for us. Like we'll shoot through this without sauce first. And then uh, we will shoot through it with sauce afterwards. Now let's say the sauce kind of bled into the um, bread or it, it dripped down further. I have that previous image where the whole sandwich is beautifully intact. So I will just put these all on in layers and mask in the sauce individually. And instead of having to rebuild an entire sandwich, um, I took care of that in maybe five minutes for a client. Um, it gets to be a problem when you're on set and you know, a client says, well, it's not working because of this one element. Let's say it's the sauce or something died on the sandwich, like the leaves were wilted or something like that, you know, and we still have six more shots in the day and it's five o'clock. You know, I can tell the client that I have an earlier image of this looking great and because the camera hasn't moved and we have it shot full focus all the way through I will just mask that, uh, you know, hero lettuce leaf in from an earlier image. Um, and that goes back to, to these. Like sometimes we will, it won't just be this bottle. Like we'll shoot lighting for the words, do a full focus stack. Then we'll do a version of it with condensation on it. Um, and again, I mean, like clients will get into it and be like, you know, can we remove this one piece of condensation over the M? So we have to shoot the whole thing in full focus stack before we add condensation to it. Um, a lot of those little detail things um, are what we do best, but it's also, you know, the focus stacking kind of, it's like saving throughout your document. You know, if you're building a Photoshop file, you want to make sure you can go back in time and utilize something that you had looking good pr previously. Um, now, when you're working with macro things, let's say, you know, you're shooting this, but, you know, they would like something from the glass back here before when we weren't even looking at the glass. Well, I was shot this whole thing in the full focus stack, so this glass was in focus at the same time also. Um, so that really helps us save some time. Um, Uh, he'd like to know what kind of retouching do you do on set, if any at all? So um, let's say, I'll use this one for example. Let's say we um, have an art director on set and the client is remote. So when we shoot for Burger King, um, they're based in Miami, Florida. We're in Cleveland, Ohio, but we're shooting this sandwich and you know, we have the final one in and everything's looking good. But by the time we got to putting sauce on and got approval with that, the cheese wasn't looking very melted. 
or the bacon wasn't looking very shiny. But we have that captured from an earlier image. Um, I would go back and kind of just put all the hero elements of this sandwich together really quickly in post from our full focus stacks. So I would make the cheese look really melty. I would grab the one where the, the sauce looked the freshest. Um, you know, especially for this Coke back here. So, so the fizz lasts for, you know, less than a second. So that's something that I would mask in on set. The hero ice, it falls very quickly. So that's something that I'd mask in on set. But at the same time, when someone's working remotely, you know, it's hard to explain to someone, well, I'm gonna take this hero fizz and the hero top and the, the hero cheese and put that all together in an image. If I can do that in five minutes and then send the client this image right after we've shot it, you know, we're gonna get an approval, we're gonna get um, no questions asked later. I can put notes into our final retoucher afterwards that that is the process we're gonna use to do this. Um, so we really shoot in a lot of elements just to make sure that everything is looking like as fresh as possible. Um, same with this stuff, like this Alfredo sauce, like it will start to congeal and if you put steam on it, it will get little bubbles of oil in it and everything. So we basically put this stuff on right away and you have maybe a, a, a 30 seconds to capture. Um, but then let's say afterwards the client comes back to you and says, oh, can we move this noodle, you know, a, a half a centimeter this way? <laughs> like, but all your sauce now is ruined. So I already shot everything with the sauce looking great. So I can just wipe that sauce in from an earlier capture, move the noodle, shoot it again, and then combine those together. So at the end of the day, this is the final image that they saw for approval. I didn't have to explain anything to them or say like, imagine if you will, like, you know, this is looking great and this is looking great and this is looking great. I build these Photoshop documents as the day goes on so at the end of the day, they know exactly what they're going to get. And it's in full focus. And I show them the layers and what their uh, options are. So again, I even cropped this one down. Um, but there's extra room on the sides of this one. Normally, you'd have the whole plate so they can move the plate over or this plate over uh, in, in post afterwards. This is one more. Um, normally, these would all be on individual layers. Um, these are steam layers now. But basically, like, we'd shoot the front items and then take this away, and then you would basically work backwards so you have an empty surface. So each and every layer then would be clickable for the client, and then they can move it around in post. Um, now, again, like, this gets to be a lot of files. Um, you keep doing focus stacks and you keep saying, well, this focus stack is for just the cheese and this focus stack is for just the sauce and this is for just the fizz. It gets to be a lot. So at the end of shoot, you're like we might have uh, 20 or 30 of these full focus folders with 24 to 40 images in each folder. So, you know, for us to automate um, our workflow and have these quick keys in order and capture one. Um, it's great because the uh, digital tech can be on set and just be organizing and making sure that everything is labeled correctly. I'll go back onto our server, I'll show you past job. Stop screen share for just a second here. Anybody have any questions about any of that? I've I talked kind of quickly through um, our process with that.
Jim. Uh, he's here. Uh, it says focus breathing is when not just the size, but the aspect ratio is changing. I've seen this in every lens I use from large format digitars to high Z 150 milliliters. Uh, I assume they have also, they have come across this as well with their lenses. What lens series do you use? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, we use a 120 uh, Schneider lens that goes with the phase camera. Um, and we use that lens instead of an older uh, medium format lens because it actually lines up with the uh, XF body and it talks to the um, camera so then it can automate the full focuses. So that lens, because it's an autofocus lens and it's a macro lens, um, allows us to do that. If we had a manual focus lens or like an older Mamiya lens on there, um, we wouldn't be able to utilize the uh, full focus stacking. Um, hope that answers your question. Um, it's, we try to, we, we have it down right now where we know how many shots we need to take where the focus doesn't not overlap. Um, and, you know, sometimes we'll go in and just make sure that the focus, as we're moving forward on these full focuses, um, does overlap. And let me show you that really quick, actually. So, this is literally how small these movements are shot to shot. So as long as the next shot is in focus right here where it's just slightly out of focus, the the end product that we get through uh, Helicon is going to be tack sharp throughout. If you overshoot and this is in focus and you miss a little bit of focus here and then this is in focus, you're going to get these band of blurries through your image. Um, and you'll definitely notice that when you put it in Helicon and run it, you'll see these like blurry bars throughout. That means you missed a focus point. Um, you know, we, we are on the side of caution where we kind of, you know, incrementally go. Um, and that just makes sure that we don't have to hold up and like inspect these files one by one after we do them. So... I guess uh, one question that uh, Martina has was, uh, since no one seems to be asking all this question, uh, who gets the, the stuff? <laughs> uh, sometimes at the end of the day, you don't want to eat it. Sometimes we can't stop eating it all day long. It really depends on the product. Um, yeah, sometimes it's a definite problem in the studio when we have uh, all the food in all the time. Um, but mo for the most time, uh, the hero stuff on set, like this, this sandwich, it's been on set now for, I want to say four hours, uh, and it's a veggie sandwich, so I would not eat it. <laughs> um, you know, there's all the ingredients are in the kitchen, and sometimes we'll use the extra ingredients to make little sandwiches and put out for client and crew, and that's kind of a nice uh, midday snack or... Um, you know, end of the day snack too. So again, like this is one job we did. This is tips folder. These are each individual shots. And then these are the full focus stacks that we did within them or individual files. So there can be a lot going on with these, these files. Um, From Sarah, uh, she asked, can you elaborate on how the digital tech organizes the files? Do you embed metadata in your files? So we embed, I have a uh, embed that's worked into the camera that automatically puts our information into each raw file. Um, after the end of the shoot, when we deliver files to client, um, we will um, run it through, it's kind of an, I would say it's antiquated, but. We run it through Bridge and we just kind of uh, pen the metadata um, that way. 
after we're done. Because I mean, if you ran through each and every one of these files, it would just take a, a really long time. And you know, it's not really necessary because some of these files we don't use in the end. And then when you export uh, through Helicon, it becomes a new file in itself. So a lot of the individual shots, we don't end up sending to client. It's a, it's a the full focus stacked file that gets put into the Photoshop document and then the Photoshop document then gets uh, tagged in metadata. Everything else we keep internally on our server. Um, and a note on workflow too is, you know, doing these full focus stacks with cameras that are like are, have this much resolution, we have to be on top of our server space constantly. Um, you know, we, we just got a 48 terabyte Pegasus server earlier this year. And I would say we're probably through that in about a year, year and a half. And uh, yeah, it just, it just eats it up. Like we have to um, hardwire in each station so we can transfer files to the server uh, quickly. Um, yeah, it just, it, it takes some time. I think that is about all I have for the presentation. I have uh, uh, one more question. Uh, this is from Dylan. Uh, she says, do you ever forget you're working with something edible? I often find while shooting, I forget that even food becomes more of a product. Yeah. Um, well, like I said before, uh, we do those stand-ins for a reason. And basically, we have to get everything as lit and nailed down as possible before the hero food comes in to set because if we don't do that then you know especially with um the veggie sandwich that i was showing you that we shot today um i'll bring that back up you know i kept asking our food styles claire um you know how much time do we have left on this because any of these start to wilt and then you have to really kind of scramble and figure out, you know, am I going to do this in post? Do we need to rebuild? And really, I'd say on a given shoot with a client, the worst thing you want to hear is we need to rebuild this, this hero food. Um, it just is very uh, time. Uh, it takes up a lot of time. And, you know, sometimes you might get feedback that just says, well, it didn't look that good. And there's not really a good direction on what didn't look good or whatever. So, you know, when we have to rebuild these things, it takes some time. So if we are ready to work and move things around, because sometimes they might be like, move this uh, red onion to the left a centimeter, or this bun needs to go back a little bit. You know, with this sandwich in particular, we probably had maybe a half an hour to work with it, maybe that. Um, and it depends on the food too. If you're shooting ice cream, you're shooting real ice cream, you know, you maybe have a couple minutes um, with cheese, you know, we'll get everything ready to go. And if, if there needs to be a cheese melt, we'll shoot through it in the full focus without it melted. And then we'll come in with a steamer and steam all the cheese so that melts. And then that cheese looks good and melted for about a minute. And then it looks disgusting. So, you really have to work quickly and have a game plan for how you're going to capture what you need to capture. Because if I were to shoot that uh, sandwich, you know, and this one didn't need a cheese melt, but if we needed a cheese melt and we melted the cheese and then showed the client and they said, oh, we need to move this, 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 well, the sandwich is already dead. It's ruined and we probably have to rebuild. And that can sometimes take hours to, to rebuild depending on the, the product. So, um, you know, as much as we can do quickly in camera and problem solve with what's on set, um, the more efficient the day runs, um, the more happy clients are. And, you know, doing those full focus stacks um, intermittently through the capture process um, really gives you the latitude to go back in time and be like, you know, I like this leaf better from the first capture than this leaf. And I actually did that on this one. We had, this was the original sandwich. 
that we liked. Um, we liked this back part of this, right? We liked how that, um, is that a carrot? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> carrot sticking out the back. But then this sandwich was from earlier when it was just kind of standing up a bit more. So we kind of merged them together to be one sandwich. Um, so it gives you the, the um, ability to kind of patch these things together from a few different uh, shots. And that being said too, you can always work backwards from the full focus. Let's say that the uh, client wants the focus to fall off here, like three quarters of the way back of the sandwich. You know, that's as easy as going into your uh, files. And just selecting the first 16. Now we know that this is our last image where our focus is going to fall off. Right? So when a client asks me, like, can we go back in time and, and, and make this a more shallow depth of field shot? Absolutely. We have it captured in full focus, and we can give you as much focus and as little focus as you need. Um, so really, it's, you know, it's a huge tool for not only moving around in post, but also kind of covering your own butt when you're going into post about what your client has as an asset and what they don't. Um, you know, we will still go through all the trouble of, you know, breaking down a set and having everything on their own layers. And somewhere along the line, they'll ask, you know, do you have, we, if we had a fork in here at one point, do you have that in focus at one point? And, you know, we've learned over the years to always capture it and always save it out. And even if you never use it, keep it on the server just in case. Um, and really that gives us a lot of ground later. If they come back, you're like, sure, we have it. We'll send it to you. It's no problem. Um, it's kind of embarrassing when you, you know, two weeks after a shoot and they're like, oh, did you capture this? And you don't have anything. So it really just kind of covers our butt and makes sure that we have everything that they need. Uh, question from Kenneth. Uh, he asked, do you primarily shoot with strobes as opposed to constant light? Uh, um, yes. We shoot with strobes primarily um, only because we uh, are in a daylight studio. And if we shot with hot lights, you know, it, you could get some contamination from the windows. Um, you know, we, we dial up these packs pretty high. So, you know, if we're shooting the sandwich all day long, that guarantees that the lighting looks exactly the same as it does at 8 a.m. as it does at 6 p.m. Um, you know, if you're running, like I showed you that uh, cocktail set, we did that all day long. You know, if, if by afternoon, um, the lights changed in the studio, compositing that together becomes a nightmare. Um, so yeah, we, we tend to shoot mainly with strobes. Uh, we're getting into more motion, uh, which is a whole different beast. So we're, we have some hot lights in the studio. We've shot some stills with them, but you just have to make sure that it's not going to be an image that is going to be very uh, uh, time, time consuming. Um, you know, because if we're, if we're shooting a uh, hot light image all day long, the light could change around or we'd have to block off the light with dividers throughout the studio. And we have four sets in here. We don't really have a whole lot of room to block off each and every set with dividers around. That would just be a maze. So strobes really give us the flexibility to just kind of shoot the same thing all day long and make sure that we have control over it the most. I think across the board, all these things I've talked about today are just kind of controlling variables in the shoot. So uh, the client can be like, you know, I want this light to be different up front. I have the dial for it, we can do it, we can run the full focus and everything's very um, quick and efficient. Do you work with smart objects? Um, we don't. Um, I know some people have, I've worked with in the past. 
and that's just not what we do a whole lot. Um, it's a lot of clipping paths and um, mass and shadowing. Um, and most of the time we just send these simplified Photoshop documents to the ad agencies and then they kind of manipulate even further however they need it. Um, but short answer, no, we don't really use smart objects. Jerry, um, we actually were doing your um, uh, workflow, I guess, during capture. Um, you have it set to auto white balance. Um, is there any reason that you prefer using that? Uh, it's selected, um, but we do a color card at the beginning of each session, and we just select the gray. And then beyond that, I can show you real quick all the uh, fun stuff that I end up doing to that. So we'll do a gray card, I'll select it on in camera, and then either with gels on strobes or um, color balance. So I have my shadows down to a little bit blues, highlights are skewed a little bit more warm. Um, I go in, I usually bump up my contrast quite a bit because we have a lot of lights going on. And then depending on the, dyna uh, the dynamic level of the image, like I'll work with my dynamic range. I might work with levels and pull that in. And then even curves, I can kind of pull up the reds and pull in the bottom. Uh, this one, I pulled down my midtones a little bit. So I kind of have a, a normal go-tos that I will do with my lighting setup that and manipulate in Capture One. The good part with that is I think Capture One does a pretty good job overall with these universal um, adjustments. Uh, I do use the layers tool every once in a while. Like if I really can't, sometimes I'll use mirrors and someone's like, can you get some light right in here? I'll use a mirror, but even a mirror can be kind of aggressive sometimes. So I can just take the layers and just kind of select that area with a a feathered brush and bring up the shadows in a certain area. Um, then we output it. It's all, I keep those adjustments on. And then the re, our retoucher at the end will make any more adjustments beyond that. Um, but I tend to do as much color and uh, uh, grading as I can in camera, just because we have to turn around a lot of these things within days. Like we'll get done shooting and this whole entire PSD for this brand equity shoe um, has to be turned around to the client the next day. And that's stacking images, retouching, um, and then building out this document and then clipping everything out and, and, and putting it together in a big Photoshop document. So, um, yeah, that's usually our workflow. So I usually make as much adjustments in camera as possible through the capture program. and. Uh, and I'll, we have a, a retouching log. We'll write down anything beyond that. And a lot of times it's just kind of layering a, a file with, this is the shot for the hero cheese and this is the layer for the hero bun. And whatnot. So, are there any other questions? Uh, okay, good. Uh, so, so he is not recommending using manual lenses for Helicon or just that you have, have to get really good at stepping focus. I'm not not recommending it. I, you can definitely do it. And I did it for a bunch of years. And I was just, I've been fortunate enough to work with the, the, the phase camera. And the problem with doing it all day long and you're using a macro lens and you're just nonstop, like little tiny things looking through and seeing where your focus is, your eyeballs feel like they're going to fall out at the end of the day because you've just been focusing uh, nonstop all day long. So you can definitely do manual focus. And if it's just one shot or a few shots or all day long, you can definitely do it. Um, the system we have set up right now is just more efficient. And it is like, I thought I was gonna go blind for a while because I, I was couldn't see straight, couldn't drive home at the end of the day because of all the full focus stacking we were doing, shooting it manually. Um, with the phase program, like I said, you just press that back button, you can walk away. 
and it'll run through the 24 images and the, the strobes will pop and everything like that. Um, and it, it really saves time in, in, in your eyeballs overall. Uh, we have a question from Phil. Uh, he wants to know if you ever used a view camera like an Arca Swiss M. Um, I've used a view camera before with uh, capture back, but never for focus stacking. Actually, I take that back. I've worked with someone when I was photo assisting who built this ingenious setup where it was actually a view camera um, on a motorized platform and the the front element and the back element would slowly move away from each other. And then he would just program the front and back focus and, and go with it. So I'm assuming that, I don't know if that is commercially available for sale, that rigging setup that he had, or if he made that himself, but that would be his same kind of way to automate it. Um, but uh, we normally just work with the uh, uh, XF camera with uh, the face, face back. The question from Pablo, uh, he asked, what is a good strategy to select the objects with Photoshop? Uh, it depends on the, the contrast level. Um, you know, normally when I'm doing it for a client, I'm, I'm working super fast just to show them what it's going to look like. So sometimes, you know, I, I can use magnetic lasso. I'll use the wand tool. We'll, um, if say, if that gets approved, the comp I did, when we send the images to our retoucher, who gets them that same day and starts working on that same shot, um, she most of the time uses pads and we'll do a, a she's very good with the Wacom and, and, and pads and, and uses it that way. So it's really speed and your comfort level. I know that I, I don't have a Wacom out here on set. Um, so I just kind of do it, I guess the old fashioned way and just uh, clean it up from uh, magic wand, magic lasso, um, sometimes pads, depends. And a question from Teresa. She asks, can you show us your set again before we wrap up here? Sure. So this is the set. So we have the camera on a FOBA stand. We always tape down the legs to the sawhorses. So just in case when the food stylist or assistant or me or anybody that's on set, like we kick the set by accident, we didn't ruin everything. Um, we're doing the full focus stacks and then making them into one uh, big Photoshop document. You wanna make sure that you don't kick the set. That's very important. <laughs> then, uh, so we have fill light here. This is the side light that's lighting the uh, shadow side of the sandwich. Um, we have some background lights that are lighting up the background. The beauty dish over there is kind of like the key kicker that runs just across the veggies in the sandwich. And then the V-flat that just kind of runs as like a, an overall fill for the uh, entire image. We'll kind of go around and show you the backside. So the back of the set is just really simple and we kind of rig up the background surface back here. We have a cookie in place to kind of dap a little light on the background. And I have a few small flags that I use a lot for the food uh, because it's just so small that I can take some light off the, that drink that was in the background or the cutting board or anything like that. So it's a pretty involved set for just a small sandwich. Um, but I do that because, you know, if, if a client comes and says that they want to take a little light off the background or they want to take a little light off the fill or something like that, I can just turn a dial and and fix the problem rather than having to figure out a whole new lighting setup for a client. One last question about your uh, about files. Um, how long do you keep files that you don't use on your server? And is there a schedule? Um, like you said, these files take up a lot of space. So how we handle that is raw images I keep on the carts on set. So we'll keep raw images 
on the computer for about a week. There's another um, large external hard drive on each cart that houses raw images for about six months. Then on the server, we keep our TIFFs for about two years. And then our final files, we keep indefinitely. We have, we, we, this uh, studio started in 2014. We have all final files from 2014. Working files, the Photoshop files, you know, it depends on the client. It depends on, but normally we will keep them for about two years. Um, you know, if it's a client we work with often and it's a big client, we'll keep them no matter what. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of uh, hard drives on each cart and then the server is just kind of like the mothership and it's it's rated and backed up. And then we also have a cloud backup service that at night it backs up the server to a cloud. So in case there's a fire in this whole building, you know, I can download the entire server at another time um, and not have to worry about it. And that's Backblaze. And Backblaze is also compatible with uh, the ChronoSync software that I showed earlier. Um, Jeff, I think you might be on mute. Sorry. Um, okay, I'm back. Um, yeah, so I think we've answered all the questions uh, as far as I can tell. So I want to thank uh, Andrew for your time and taking us on the studio tour. Uh, thank you guys for attending, and uh, we hope to see you guys on the next Project Loveded webinar. Thank you, everyone. Right. Thank you, everyone. Bye. See ya. Stay safe.